Welcome to DMV Spotlight on ESPN 630, the sports capital, where we shine a light on local stories from the District, Maryland, and Virginia to inform, enlighten, and inspire you. I'm Barbara Britt, and my guest this morning, I'm delighted to welcome from D.C. Central Kitchen, Mike Curtin, Jr. He's the CEO there at D.C. Central Kitchen, and I just want to thank you so much for joining me today on DMV Spotlight. Thanks for having me, Barbara. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So, so D.C. Central Kitchen has been around for about 30 years. 31. We just marked 31. Well, congratulations. Yeah. And so for folks, I know that your your tagline is, we fight hunger differently. We're not even going to go into the fact that we have hunger in D.C. in the DMV area. We know that we do, um, as sad as it is. But, but tell us um, a little bit about how D.C. Kitchens, D.C. Central Kitchen operates differently in this particular battle? Because we know there's other organizations, I'm sure you all uh, partner in various ways, but um, but how is it unique? Sure. Well, it's it's, it's sort of counterintuitive in a way that we, we've recognized, and the kitchen is based on a couple basic principles. And one of those, the first is that food will never end hunger. We will never, ever feed our way out of hunger. And for years, decades, really, in this country, we've had this notion that if we just give away enough free food, somehow that will make hunger go away. Uh, And clearly that hasn't worked, and and nor will it. And that's kind of discouraging. It it is discouraging. Well, And you look at the work that we do today, like every day, we produce 10, put 10,000 meals into the community. Uh, So, uh, you know, by the end of next week, we will have sourced, produced, served, and delivered more food than every person in this building will eat in their lifetime. So one would then draw the natural conclusion, if food was the answer, we'd be done and we would have moved on. But clearly that's not the the issue. What we really need to do, and this is what the kitchen focuses on, using food as its tool, the means, not the end, is to get folks to a place where, uh, a place from um, dependency to independence, where they don't need a free sandwich or a free meal or to wait in line for food, but they can afford to buy that meal. Ultimately, what Dr. King and and Cesar Chavez and Bobby Kennedy were fighting for, that that opportunity for economic independence. Uh, And so that's why the kitchen not only provides meals and, and serves meals, but uses that food to train individuals who have faced immense barriers to employment, barriers like histories of incarceration, addiction, abuse, trauma, trafficking, uh, so they can get jobs in the hospitality industry and support themselves and their families. All I can think of when you're telling me this is the very old adage about you teach a man to fish. And and I'm sure everybody has heard that, that they you give them a fish and they can eat for a day. You you teach them to fish and they can eat for a lifetime. Is there a, is there a parallel there? Sure, absolutely. And people have used that, that proverb, which I think is, is cool because it's been sort of co-opted and claimed by just about every culture or, 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 or you know, country, uh, it's really a matter of what refrigerator door magnet or bumper sticker you read. It's either a Chinese proverb, an African proverb, Middle Eastern proverb. But what we really are looking at now is to say it's great. We're, we're giving some fish. We're teaching people to fish. But what if the fishermen are still unemployed yeah. and fisherwomen? And so that's really what we're really trying to do at D.C. Central Kitchen is look at a new way to fish. So that is, it's really cool. So you really are training people in, in the culinary arts um, so that they can have this path forward. So let's start at the, be- how do you find these people? How do you get connected to the people who have these barriers to employment? Sure. Well, we, we start with the, the agencies and organizations where we, to whom we provide food. So we go and recruit at uh, halfway houses, at recovery programs, at transitional programs, reentry programs. Uh, we go to the local uh, jails. Uh, we do video connections and conferences with federal prisons that house some D.C. inmates because uh, these are the individuals that will be coming back to the district, coming back to our area. Uh, and we know we can have the most significant, not only short term and immediate, but long term and generational economic impact with um, one of the biggest failures we have as a country is our as our criminal justice system. Um, more almost our 70 percent of the people that get out of prison will reoffend and go back to prison, um, costing us all more money. Um, and not just money. And not well, and not just money, and and not an insignificant amount of money. You know, it costs about the same amount of money to send someone to Harvard for a year as it does to keep someone in prison or a shelter, really, for that matter. Um, but folks who have have come through our program are about less than five percent 
likely to recidivate. So about 90% less likely to recidivate. So we're talking literally hundreds of millions of dollars a year across the country with organizations doing the work like DC Central Kitchen does um, that not only saves money, but puts money into the economy because now people are, are getting a paycheck, they're paying taxes, they're buying food, they're moving off of SNAP, which is the idea. They're moving out of shelters, which this is the idea. It's, they're supporting their kids and breaking, ultimately, and here's the thing, Barbara, breaking the cycle, the generational cycle of poverty that is corrupt killing us as a nation and and it is true because you do see that I mean I you and I maybe are old enough to remember where there was that older generation that would support the young and now we're talking two or three generations now into that absolutely where you just have you know a welfare system that has just perpetuated this this dependence that really is a is a snare for people and they need to get free from it and this is an amazing way so once you identify these people do do you do you ask them hey would you like to do this or is are do they get assigned or how does that how does that part well work? it's it's an application process we we provide uh, the information and we want people to come and, and really it's, it's like any other academic institution or programming that you would do we we go out and recruit i have my youngest daughter is going through the college process now and it's it's not at all different from that process uh we visit schools or they visit us and say hey we'd like you to come and this is what we have to offer this is how it goes this is what you're going to be asked to do this is what you can expect but this is what you can expect on the end too uh, and then they go through individuals who who decide they want to make that change and this is why one of the reasons why the program works because it really has to be a self-selection and you really have to have been at a point or at a point where you say this is what I want what what I've been doing what has been happening is not is no longer sustainable it's not an option for me any longer I need to do something different uh, and so once an individual can make that decision and determination for themselves, then they go through an application process, which includes two interviews with our staff, many of whom have been through the programs themselves. Um, there's a trial in the kitchen, so they're absolutely supervised, again, by men and women who have been through that program to see if indeed this is something they're interested in. Um, there's drug testing, and uh, and at the end of the day, at the end of that, not in significant process, we make our selections and admit students to, to the program. Do you wish you had more opportunity for more students? Is that a struggle? Absolutely it is. And it's one of the most painful parts of the work that we do is we simply don't have the space for everyone that, that we want. Again, like just about every other academic institution that, that uh, has a selective process. Uh, we are in, we have been in the process. We are in the process. We're hoping that soon we will have be at the end of that process of finding a, a new location, a home for the future that would allow us to significantly increase uh, those training opportunities. But we do have, a, a, in the meantime, and we can talk about this in a little bit, we are we have expanded to a, um, our, a separate program that is allowing us to, to gain, to, to accept more students. That is awesome. And I just have to ask, is just because I'm curious, when folks are in your program, um, do are they staying in a dorm? Are they staying in a, I mean, we're talking about people who may or may not have means to have an apartment already sure. or, or a place. How does that work? How that, that portion um, of Most it? of the bro folks that are in uh, our program are, are in our class or in our program are in other programs. So many of them are staying in shelters or in halfway homes or uh, they may be staying with relatives. Um, some may actually have some version of, um, of their own housing. Um, folks aren't, it, it's a, it's a, the program is significant enough um, and rigorous enough that it's we don't work with students, folks who are on the streets. We do if if we do encounter individuals who are interested in the program that are in that situation, we'll work to get them into a stable housing situation before they come through the program. Um, and again, that's one of the benefits of having been around for 31 years is that we know most of the other folks in this field, if not all, and can help folks get to a place where they're better positioned to come through the program. And, you know, and that's such a good point. I'm speaking today with Mike Curtin. He's the CEO at D.C. Central Kitchen. Um, there there are a lot of organizations in D.C. that are, you know, amazing people doing their best, pouring in effort, time, talent, treasure into this, as you said, this problem that really hasn't been cured, at least for as long as, as we've been around. But tell us about how they they come into the program, they get the different training. Um, 
how important is it to these to these people to see themselves working and to be part of a of a I always think when there's an organization that's busy it's like a well-run machine everybody's got their little spot we do it here in radio um, and and it's like a humming machine sure. and it's going well mm-hmm. well I, I'd like to think of the kitchen as a, as a well-oiled machine um, and, and I think being part of something is 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 huge. I think it's it's a human condition. It's something we all long for, no matter where we are, who who we are, what what experiences we've had, what stories we can tell. Uh, we all want to be part of something bigger, something more important, and we certainly see that with with our students. We also see it with our staff. I think you know certainly that's my story coming to DC Central Kitchen. We see it with the this, all of the sixteen thousand volunteers that come through our doors every year, looking to be part of of something more. Um, in regards to specifically with jobs from our uh, for our students, our graduates, um, there is and something we take for granted, I think, and something that's missed in today's conversation about employment and work and unemployment is is the the value and the dignity of a job. Uh, that, that I've literally seen that transform lives, even if it is an entry level job. Someone at 45, 50, 60 or older, maybe their first job in their entire life uh, and, and the, the thrill of someone bringing in the first paycheck stub or, uh, you know, I, I have stories of folks coming in when they got their first apartment and bringing in their first bill with their name on it. And, and you know, who, who would have ever thought that this is something you celebrate is it receiving a bill. But for, for many folks, this is truly a sign of, again, of, of belonging to something bigger, to being part of this community. Um, in all the years that I've been at the kitchen, I've never seen anyone uh, who enjoys being living in a shelter or enjoys living in prison or enjoys the fact that they're having to, to feed their, you know, barely feed their family at the end of the month on food stamps or SNAP. No, no one does that. No one wants that. Everyone wants to be uh, in a better place. And, and that getting that job, having that, that connection uh, and that sense of value is, uh, is immeasurable. That is amazing. And you do, you have a cafe, you have catering, um, and a lot of it is right in Ward 8, where we know that there has been just systemic issues for years. I mean, every ward has its issues in D.C. Um, but tell us, if we're to walk into the cafe, sure. uh, tell us what that's so like. So the, the cafe uh, is really, we opened up in May of, of 2019. Um, and that that's really the culmination in many regards, many ways of the, the social enterprise work that we've been engaged in for the last... 2015 or so, maybe a little longer than that, years. Uh, we started catering in the late 90s uh, before the word social enterprise was really invented. I think we just thought it would be a cool thing to do and sort of really – we did it more to challenge people's ideas about what was possible uh, and, and what could be done uh, than anything else. And then as this field evolved, we started doing more catering. Uh, in, in 2008, we started doing locally sourced scratch cook school food really in response to the – recession at the time, knowing that we needed to expand our mission footprint, but we had to do it in a way that wasn't relying on philanthropy. And so we moved into school food and contracts, and we've expanded with D.C. public schools, and that generates millions of dollars and creates dozens of jobs every year. Uh, but the culmination was was last year with the D.C. Central Kitchen Cafe opening, uh, opening at the ARC, the uh, Town Hall Education Arts and Recreation Campus down in uh, 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast in Ward 8. Uh, we're one of 14 nonprofits in that building its uh, community center slash nonprofit hub. And you walk in and this is a cafe like any other cafe in the city, probably cooler, right? We'd like to think and a little more mission based. Um, but the cool thing about the cafe is that is it is the incubator or the facilitator for a, a program that focuses entirely on youth, uh, young adults ages 18 to 24. Um, uh, sadly or optimistically, in, in our sector, that group of, of individuals um, that are disconnected from work, that are often uh, – that are not in school, that probably haven't finished – if 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 they may have gone to high school but haven't finished it, most haven't gone, um, often disconnected with their families, disconnected with their communities. Um, they're called opportunity youth, and so we are looking for a way to uh, reach this – generation this group of individuals uh, and provide them again with skills to 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 work uh, and sadly um, there are two places in the United States of America where that group of individuals 18 to 24 disconnected from jobs work in their communities uh, are growing one is Nebraska 
and one is the capital of the United States here in Washington, D.C. And east of the Anacostia River in Ward 8, one in three uh, you, a, individuals ages 18 to 24 fit that demographic, and that's just, uh, it's unacceptable and really criminal. Uh, and we're just trying to do the best we can to, to break into that and, and um, you know, and offer some hope and opportunity. And again, we know because of all the efforts of all these organizations, and even we know from uh, the mayor and the administration, they poured a lot of money into the schools. I mean, per per student, as you as you pointed out, there's a lot of money coming in, but for some reason, it's not targeting these young people in the way that is meaningful to them. So when they when they when they get a job, do they apply for the job at the at the cafe? Um, well, the, the part of the training process is working in the cafe. So for years, our adult training program has focused on what we call back of the house, kitchen uh, work, not waiter, cashier, front of the house. We just don't have the facilities or we haven't used that as a training opportunity. Um, because one of the, the areas that we see now is the largest growing, fastest growing, is what people call fast casual um, uh, so the, you know, the the Nando's, the beef steaks, the uh, Chipotle, all, all the stuff that is sort of back in front of the house, sort of a mix, um, is the largest growing area of the, or the sector uh, uh, in, in the hospitality industry right now. Uh, and so this cafe gives us an opportunity to train students not only in the classroom areas, which are wildly important in the, what we call empowerment side of, of things, empowerment skills, but in the back of the house with the catering work that we do there, the prep work for the cafe, and in the front of the house, working with guests uh, and being part of you know, an engaging, uh, active uh, you know, neighborhood uh, environment. And that, that really is a skill um, to be able to interchange just with with strangers in a way where you are are confident and and able to serve them. I mean, I know we all have stories where we've been in stores or restaurants and we have not necessarily felt welcome on any spectrum of socioeconomic. Um, just because it it is a skill that has to be taught. It's a skill that has to be learned. Whether you're in Ward Eight or whether you're in Chevy Chase, you yep. have got to teach somebody how to walk up to a table and and welcome people or take their order behind the counter. And you have a history yourself in hospitality. Sure. Well, I, I think uh, you know. Uh, there's in one of my my favorite movies. There's an old line in in. Um, Something about you know, it's all ball bearings, and what we say is it's all it's all customer service. Everything is customer service, and it's unfortunately a skill and that we don't teach or that we we don't overtly value enough in our society. Yet everyone does value it greatly and is very upset when they don't feel that they're receiving it. Uh, and so this is something important. And and again, it's a piece of it's a skill that will allow people to have a job that's transferable wherever they are, uh, whenever they are. Uh, and and that's part of what I as you said I did come up in the the hospitality business, if you will. I, I worked in, started here in, in D.C. in hotels and restaurants. I ran my own restaurant in uh, Falls Church for almost five years. That's um, a rough, that's it, it, a well, rough it is, business. It is, it, is a, it is a rough business. It's a time that I refer to now as my first experience in the nonprofit sector. It's only my own... <laughs> My own restaurant, so it, it, I, it's been it's been it's been long enough where I I can laugh. It wasn't that easy uh, years yeah. ago. It was very difficult, but as I said, it was a, it was a difficult time in my life, um, and I didn't know what was next. You know, here I was, an op- a, a person that had uh, had amazing opportunities. Uh, I took advantage of them. I worked hard uh, my entire life growing up here in the D.C. area. Um, going to, to schools that, um, that that I was just incredibly blessed. I did nothing to earn on my own, but was able to attend. Uh, and yet here I was after all that, again, working hard um, and ultimately failing and, and really not knowing what was next, not unlike at all, unlike our, many of our students. And um, I was fortunate enough that while I was in the restaurant business, I got to know Robert Egger, who founded DC Central Kitchen. And I went and I volunteered and I did some events for the kitchen at my restaurant. And a couple of years after I had gotten out of my restaurant, I was doing some consulting work and came across an opportunity for what was then the, the chief operating officer job. And uh, I thought, oh, my God, this is a, this is remarkable. I never considered that this thing, this place would actually provide this very, to me, natural uh, and perfect next step. And uh, so I applied, you know, met Robert for coffee and, and talked about it. And as they say, the rest is history. That was a little over 15 years ago. Um, so, you know, as I said, like many of our students, most of our students, I walked in there looking for 
what was next? You know, what was going to be that thing for me that was going to allow me to become the person that I wanted to be? And that's what DC Central Kitchen has been. That is so cool. And one of the other ways that you fight hunger differently is that I know that DC Central Kitchen is very focused on food waste. And while not all of us have had various struggles that you've mentioned, we all are very aware, I think, at this point that that there is a lot of food that's wasted in our nation, in our kitchens, in our hydrators, in you know, in, in those in the lunchroom at work. Um, so tell us how that component sure. fits into your mission. Well, as I said earlier, what, what, when we the kitchen was founded on these this first well, a, a principle that that um, that food won't end hunger. The other principle that was founded on is that waste is wrong, um, and that waste could be food, could be people, could be kitchens that weren't being used. Uh, but again, Robert, having worked in the restaurant business, uh, recognized that we were just throwing out, he and all of his fellow restaurateurs and hoteliers and caterers around the city were throwing out pounds and pounds and pounds of good food. If you've ever night. been on a Sunday morning after the brunch or the afternoon after the brunch at a beautiful hotel in D.C., sure. you'll just see them just take trays and dump yep. it into yep. the trash. They have to. Yep. Well, law. some of that, some of the, actually, some of that is true that you have to do it by law. Interestingly, when we started, there was a lot of people saying that, well, there's a law we can't possibly use donated food. This was one of these urban myths uh, that, that people used basically because it was easier to throw stuff out than figure out how to use it. Uh, and um, when we started the kitchen, one of the first groups that, that came to work with us was the Mar uh, Marriott Corporation. And um, they when they realized what we were doing and saw the power of this, not only here in D.C., but could be replicated around the country to create f future employees for the for the Marriott, the, for the hotels and the hospitality industry writ large, um, they engaged with us and at the time was the Clinton administration and Secretary of Agriculture Dan Glickman to um, create what was what has become the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Food Donation Act of 1996, which says uh, but protects organizations and donors if they follow local um, health codes and work in um, uh, licensed facilities and act in good faith from using donated food. Now, interestingly for us, over the years, you know, we would like to think that after 31 years of doing this, um, there is now – Thankfully, a great deal of attention being paid to food waste. At first, no one really thought about it or cared. It was just one of those things. And unfortunately, as a country, we have devalued food, and that's why we waste so much because it's so plentiful and so cheap. Um, and we worked really hard to have that system, but it has really in many ways backfired on us. Um, so we've actually over the years, as others have picked up on working with restaurants, say, for example uh, – as we've grown the number of meals, it's really hard to do four or 5,000 meals a day using leftover food from restaurants. So we started working with farms. We started working with wholesalers. Um, and from, for all of the work that we do, for, say our school work, our catering work, the cafe work, of course, we're using 100% purchased food for that. But what we're doing now is working directly, say, with farms and purchasing product that might be aesthetically or geometrically challenged in such a way that it still has no commercial value. It's still going to be waste. Unfortunately, this stuff will go into a compost pile or be literally plowed back into the ground. And what we found is on local family farms, in smaller farms that don't have the ability to put stuff in a, a, a train car and send it, you know, bad apples to a juicer or tomatoes to a saucer, um, they were just throwing it away. So we started buying it. And it's not bad. It's not rotten. It's just too small or too skinny or it looks a little different than we think it should. Um, and so we're putting now literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in rural economies from Pennsylvania to, to West Virginia and bringing really fresh, good, healthy food and turning it into to meals in, in schools and, and, um, and actually uh, – Cutting it, chopping it, putting it in, in uh, vacuum sealed packaging and, and selling it to uh, corner stores in the city's food deserts that are now have fresh, healthy food like you'd find in Whole Foods or China Safeway um, in, in, in food deserts that is very um, price friendly and affordable and expanding food options and opportunities around the city. That is that is so cool. I just I just absolutely love that. And I don't want to run out of time. I'm sure. very curious about the relationship with the public schools. You've mentioned that a couple of times. Sure. Well, we were, as I said, we started with the Washington Jesuit Academy in 2008, one school, putting some of our staff there, uh, using this locally sourced pro pro product uh, and doing breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the boys at this um, tuition-free private school for, um, for at-risk middle school boys. 
Uh, and we were able to expand that in 2010 to a small contract with uh, D.C. public schools. Um, after many school districts throughout the country, because of the work I think Mrs. Obama did shining light on getting good what good Healthy food in schools should be, right? Sustainable, local. Um, so they, D.C., looked to upgrade their food system. We presented them with what we were doing at the, the Washington Jesuit Academy and uh, got a small contract that has started at seven schools. Now we're at 14, and we've picked up some charters into some other schools. Uh, and again, that, that generates a significant amount of revenue, but it's also created about 70 jobs, almost all of whom are held by graduates of our training program. And most of our schools that we serve are in Ward 7, so these are areas that, again, very few healthy food, fresh food options are really changing the food landscape um, through this work that we're doing that is generating revenue, creating jobs, and helping sustain and grow our programs. That is absolutely amazing. Now, I know we're just, we're, I have to circle back because we are sure. living in the time of coronavirus, sure. and I wanted to bring up food safety anyway, because obviously when you're working with um, any restaurant any food prep safety sure. is a huge learning curve yeah. <laughs> anybody who's waited table um yeah. can tell you that that's it's critical um so obviously that's something that's part of the training but now we have a new level sure. so how do you all yeah. respond in that so, situation so so yeah, food safety is something that we have to think about probably more than just about anyone and and you know we we're inspected more often by the the, the health department i'm certain than any restaurant i ever worked in um, and it's something that our students are uh, we're, we're we're overly serious if one could be that way about about food safety in general. Um, we're also very proud of the fact that nothing has ever closed us down. Um, so this is a this is something different for us. It, you know, nine eleven we stayed open. All the snow apocalypse, snow again, we stayed open. When Red Cross, when you hear about Red Cross getting meals to bring to folks, they're getting them from us and then taking them out. Um, so these are some very significant issues. Um, we are uh, working very closely with the local restaurant association, with the CDC, with the uh, DC Department of Health, the Department of Federal Emergency Management, um, tracking everything that's happening within DC. We're very, um, we're being, we're working. We, there's a meeting that's happening right now with DC public schools to talk about the p possibilities and eventualities of what will happen if, in fact, one or, or a couple or some schools have to close. And the issue there, Barbara, and this is what we, this is where we're, we're really focusing now, is that it, it's it's not a, it just a, a convenience that some of these students get meals in schools. This is these are the meals these kids will eat these days, and and like we go into high gear over the summer to make sure students get meals. We're making plans now to make sure that there will be meals available to students, even if some of the schools do have to close. And would you, where would you put that? Or is that all part of the That's plan? That's all part project? of the plan right oh, now. So, we'll so I don't want to get up. Back. I don't want to get ahead of, ahead I, of us. I understand. And I, I, I haven't even gotten to ask you all these questions. I know you have the DC Nutrition Lab, and that just was fascinating to me. So the, 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 the Nutrition Lab is a, a production facility we opened in 2011 after we got the, the contract with DC Public Schools. Uh, so we could actually do all the work that we were now able to do. We, we we called it the Nutrition Lab because we like to think of it as the ex, the next step of the grand experiment that is DC Central Kitchen. You know, this idea that again started 31 years ago as just a way to to, to use food that was being thrown out by restaurants to to engage individuals that had been thrown out by society to to get a few healthy meals into the right hands, and that has has grown to this huge $16 million operation employing 170 people, more than half of which are graduates from our program, and a concept that's been replicated now about 100 times around the country. That is so cool. And I don't, I don't want to make, I want to make sure if people are listening today and they want to find out more, they may want to volunteer um, the website. DCCentralKitchen.org. Uh, tons and tons of information. You can, as you said, run, um, sign up to volunteer. You can invest there. You can find out about our big event that we have in November, all the other stuff that we've been doing over the, say, in the month of January. We did the Monumental Sports and Education Foundation, incredible partnership there. Uh, you can read about all of our programs, get engaged. Uh, please come down and, and visit us. That is awesome. And I know you also have a, a wish list with Amazon. Folks can do that. That's Absolutely. Yes. Pretty simple. And how many volunteers? Years do you have? Um, every year, about 16,000. Uh, we have shifts. As I say, people ask, hey, Mike, can we come volunteer? And I say, yes, but only 365 days a year. So we have a, a morning shift, we have an afternoon shift, and we have an evening shift. 
But even with that, it, it's you have to re- reserve a spot a couple months ahead of time. But please come down and, and, and be part of the work that we do to make our city a better, fair, more welcoming place for everyone. That is awesome. I've been speaking today with Mike Curtin. He's the CEO of DC Central Kitchen. You can hear his passion. And I just want to thank you so much for joining me today on DMV Spotlight. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me to be here. And the again, the website is dccentralkitchen.org. I'm Barbara Britt on ESPN 630, the sports capital.